Blessings, beloved. Anastasia, Cosmic Astrologer. Welcome back to my channel. Thanks for tuning in and um, thank you to all the new subscribers and um, thanks for your comments, guys, and the questions. I, I appreciate it and I do my best to respond to all of them. Um, right, so today's topic is actually about um, the the four main angles of the chart but not necessarily unpacking um all four angles what i really want to um share some reflections on today is what shows you in a birth chart um what might indicate an individual who is super independent uh feels quite free and liberated within themselves and therefore uh, is very uh, self-directive in their life. They, they direct their own life, as it were. Certainly that's how it feels. And to a large extent, that's very true. And the opposite of that being an individual um, who feels that their life is quite fated um, from the point of view of the relationships they form and develop through their life. And that sense of feeling that perhaps a lot of their life is um, out of their hands, as it were, because there's a there's a very strong need to respond um, and engage with other people on on different levels, uh, which can leave one feeling that a lot of what they do and decisions they make and how they respond is very much out of their control to to a large degree. Now, sorry, I'm just seeing something on my screen. This is um, a general uh, perspective, you could say, naturally with, with anything, and I think I've said this many times, you know, when, when you're looking at a birth chart, there's so many layers, okay? It's, it's multi, multi-layered, multi-dimensional. So there's, there's your, your basic principles of, and of course, depending on which branch of astrology or which you know platform you're working with, you're obviously always looking at the ascendant, the sun, the moon sign. You know, you're looking at the house positions, the sign. You're looking at you know planetary uh, aspects between uh, planets. You know, what rules the ascendant, for example? What, which planet rules the ascendant? You know, all, all these. There's so many. There's so many things to look at and explore. But um, there are some really fundamental basics as well that can be very, very useful in giving you some clues. And um, of course, also, you know, one of the most important things is the nodes, the moon's nodes and Pluto's location, especially if you're working from an EA, evolutionary um, astrological platform. Anyway, that aside, what I really want to focus on today is when an individual has um, a lot of planets on the left-hand side, namely the first, what we call the first quadrant of the birth chart, which is basically from the ascendant to the fourth house, um, and also uh, planets in the 10th, 11th, and 12th, I would say, okay? and probably the 9th too. So really what, what, what we're looking at is when we've got a heavy dose of planets on the left-hand side of the birth chart or as versus uh, a lot of planets on the right-hand side of the birth chart and what that suggests. Um, first of all, the, the ascendant-descendant axis, which is really what we're talking about here because the ascendant being the self, how you how you experience uh, your environment, how you, what filter you project through to see what you see. Um, it's, it's you, yourself, literally, and in terms of your physical appearance and manifestation as well, that's coloured very much by the ascendant sign because uh, the ascendant, uh, or first house represents your physical body, your temple. 
and the ascendant sign, as I've mentioned before, from an esoteric level represents your soul. It's your soul coming through. It's literally, if you think about the entire birth chart, the ascendant sign, which is the one that's rising on the eastern horizon when you were born, that's literally the soul incarnating into the physical body. Okay, that's why the ascendant represents the soul coming in to the material, to the physical, taking on this form and coming through, right? So, you know, any planets in the first house are always going to colour and describe so much about an individual in terms of their appearance, in terms of the energies that they vibrate, as it were, um, how they approach life in general, because the ascendant is how we approach life, how we go into life, literally. So an example would be um, if somebody had Capricorn rising or uh, Saturn close to the ascendant, this is just a general example, but I have seen evidence of this many times over, uh, including a member in my own family. When the person is born, the person who has Capricorn rising or sat close to the ascendant, it, there's quite often a, a delay with the birth or some kind of difficulty. That's a very typical um, expression of Capricorn rising uh, or Saturn on the ascendant. You know, if somebody has Aries rising, you could say it was a potentially quite a quick uh, delivery, you know, a, a quick labour. It wasn't hours upon hours. But the Capricorn Saturn energy would, would be the one where, you know, the, the mother was in labour for some ridiculous amount, like 38 hours, something like that, 40 hours or whatever. Um, so they're, they're just exempt because your, your birth is signified by the ascendant and the first house and any kind of the ascendant. That's the, the initial encounter with this uh, physical form, reality, 3D world. And then naturally, whatever planets you have in the first house, they're, they're going to describe pretty much how you approach life on, on just about every spectrum, really. And what you actually look through, what lens you look through, and therefore what, what colours are what you see in life and how you see life. You know, so another very basic, simple example, Jupiter on the Ascendant, generally the person who has Jupiter in the Ascendant is going to have a really uh, optimistic outlook in life. You know, their approach to life is with enthusiasm and confidence um, and courage and generosity and just feeling an abundance. Of, of life that's that's their energy that's that's what they're um, exuding that's what comes out of them and that's what people pick up from them as well so whatever planets you have in the first house that's going to also um, describe what others feel from you so if you've got Venus in the first house you know people feel the Venusian energy magnetic attraction principle energy which draws people into you it's a lovely energy you know the moon is the same the moon and Venus are very soft energies, so it's Neptune for that matter. Um, so, you know, Mars on the ascendant, you know, that can be a person who can come across as quite aggressive or quite pushy or too assertive or too in your face. Um, there's no right or wrong in any of these. They're just simply archetypal energies that are manifesting through us, as it were. And the ascendant in the first house describes very much the energy that we carry and that we embody and that is immediately seen and experienced uh, in our environment and by those around us. Now, the opposite side, which is the descendant, is essentially what we look for in others. So whatever sign is on the descendant and whatever planets are on the descendant in the seventh house, those energies, those archetypal energies will describe and point to what you look for in another, consciously or unconsciously. Essentially, we are trying to find aspects of ourselves through the other because there's a whole process of um, projection that takes place with the seventh house. But the initial experience is 
whatever sign is there, whatever planet is there, that's what uh, we are attracted to in other people and likewise um, equally can be repelled by others as well. So we can look at another person and be, um, uh, you know, sort of really drawn and attracted to them and admire, you know, certain qualities about them and thinking, gee, I, I love, I love how that person is, you know, so bubbly or so open or so confident. So Leo on the descendant, for example, would be uh, all those things. So you would have Aquarius rising if you had Leo on the descendant. So as an Aquarius rising, you'd be more, um, you'd be more inclined to observe um, situations around you and your environment before you actually go into anything really. Uh, Aquarius is a sign of observation. And Leo on the descendant would describe that, you know, you'd be looking for a partner potentially um, who's generous, who's got a big heart, who's really loving, who's confident and who shines and um, th those are qualities that are actually within you but you meet them through the other person and it is the meeting um, that you have with the other person that enables you in a sense to connect with those qualities within your own self but the initial encounter is projecting it onto the other person and therefore seeing it in the other person and seeing the other person being all of those things and kind of thinking gee I you know, wish I was more like that when you are really so that I'm just trying to draw a distinction you know between the ascendant and the descendant first house seventh house so going back to my original point uh, at the beginning of this video which is why I'm doing this video relating to when a person has a lot of planets on the left hand side of the chart versus a person who has a lot of planets on the right hand side of the chart right hand side I actually mean uh, Six, seven, and eight, particularly okay, those three houses. Um, <clears throat> and naturally, you know, when a person has, first of all, let's start with the left hand side. When a person has a lot of planets in the first, second, and third house, for example, um, naturally there's going to be a lot of conjunctions, what we call conjunctions, which literally means our planets uh, side by side, side by side, side by side, close together. And conjunctions are Aries, simply put. It's, it's the energy of Aries. So it's the emergence, the beginning of a new cycle, new energy being born and coming through. So when somebody has a lot of planets on the left hand side of the chart, they're, they're very, the, the archetype Aries resonates very strongly with the individual. So the, the way they kind of um, project and experience life is through their, their sheer independence. And their ability to take the lead and to direct their life and make their own decisions and not necessarily really needing to um, be meshed in relationships and uh, needing validation and reassurance from other people and so forth these people with a lot of planets on the left hand side uh, they're, they're leaders you know they're, they're very individual <clears throat> uh, they direct their own lives so they appear to be quite liberated Quite free and can be quite uh, non-committal as well you could say they don't need to be in a partnership to feel as though their life is working or that they've got some purpose or meaning there they, they just generally do their own thing that's not to say that they won't have relationships or that they can't of course they will and of course they can but the, the relationships are not a primary factor for the individual who has a lot of planets in the first house because their life is about basically doing their own thing, making their own decisions and um, being independent and free. And it's, it's as I said, it's, it's, the, um, it's the experience of new energy, you know, um, Aries, to put it quite simple. Uh, so when a person has a lot of planets on the right-hand side of the chart, um, Sixth, seventh, and eighth, particularly those three houses, I have seen this many times over. It can, it can indicate a lot of different things, really. And of course, it's always going to come down to a bunch of other factors that are influencing the chart as well. There's no question about that. But just from a very, uh, 
I wouldn't say basic necessarily, but just from a level of assessing the chart from this perspective only before you start hitting other things, a really good thing to do is to look at where's the emphasis in the chart in terms of, and, and obviously people are going to have variations of this. So some people will have planets spread out quite equally throughout their chart. Uh, some people will have a lot of planets on the uh, lower hemisphere of the chart, below the ascendant and descendant. Some people will have a lot of planets above the ascendant and descendant, above the horizon. So there, naturally there are variations and, and each of these variations point to very uh, specific um, ways that the individual operates and experiences life. But the focus today for me in terms of what I'm sharing with you guys is, as I said, many planets on the left-hand side of the chart versus many planets on the right-hand side of the chart. And the main distinction being left-hand side indicates, as I said, a person who's very independent, liberated, free, makes their own decisions, does their own thing. Um, they, you know, they just kind of charge through life. <laughs> it's a very strong energy to have a lot of planets in the first quadrant one, two, three. So the person who has a lot of planets on the right-hand side, as I said before, there are various ways that that can be expressed depending on a number of different factors, but from a very simple basic level, uh, the couple of very typical ways that this seems to manifest is that the individual feels that their life is destined and fated to the hands of other people in a very large way. Okay? Um, many plants in the sixth house can leave an individual feeling that they're not a they're not a master of their own fate, as it were. A lot of plants in the seventh and eighth house indicates an individual who is um, very enmeshed in in the lives of others and relationships. So their world is very dominated by relationships and therefore when when our life feels like it's dominated um, by these relationships that we have and that we have these fated relationships and connections with people there's a there's a large component within us that feels that we we don't have 100 percent control over our life as it were because we are constantly reacting and responding to others. That's what the seventh and eighth house is all about. It's about meeting the other, connecting with the other um, on a number of different levels, obviously described from the seventh house and, and the eighth house. The eighth house is so deep and so complex. If somebody has a lot of planets in the eighth house, there's so many complex uh, psychological, sexual, emotional, psychic uh, dynamics of exchanges going on you know, for the person in their life who has a lot of planets in their house. So very simply put, a lot of planets on the left-hand side of the chart can leave a person feeling quite free, quite independent, and um, leaving them feeling like they are directing their own life just to a very large extent they are. And a person who has a lot of planets on the right-hand side of the chart can be left feeling that their life is quite fated and at the hands of other people to a very large degree, simply because of the, um, the amount of engagement that's going on with others in relationships and the constant needing to react and respond to other people. And again, that's what the seventh and eighth house um, brings up. It's our, it's our reaction to others. It's what we meet in others. It's what we see in others. Uh, consciously or unconsciously and as I said earlier there's a lot of projection going on as well. So that's a very interesting and very powerful observation to make when you're looking at your own chart or when you're looking at other people's charts. Just start with those basics. What's happening with the four quadrants in the birth chart? Four quadrants are ascendant to IC, IC to descendant, descendant to midheaven, midheaven back to ascendant. There's four quadrants, okay? Left-hand side is freedom, independence, self-directed. Right-hand side appears to be more fated, particularly when it comes to relationships. So have a look at that and see how it, um, 
relates to you, if at all, or if you're working with other people's charts and looking at, you know, uh, trying to understand another person's chart and so forth, have a look at this particular um, concept. And just to kind of finish up, this was really just a very short video, just to point this very specific uh, point to you guys. Uh, if you're not aware of it or if you don't give it much consideration, I suggest you do. It is uh, very important. And I just want to leave the video with um, one of my most fam favorite, favorite, favorite people, soul, uh, who was on this planet till just a couple of years ago, uh, the singer Prince. And what I want to do is I'm going to show his chart for a couple of reasons. It does relate to what I've discussed, but there's a couple of things that I will expand on. So if I can just share my screen. Uh, yep. Okay, I hope this is captured because I have made the error before where I haven't shared my screen. Um, correctly. So, okay, this is Prince's birth chart. This is not a rectified time. I think I did have a rectified time somewhere, but I've, I've uh, misplaced it. So anyway, this is the time that I've just taken from uh, what's been publicly uh, given. It would be very close to uh, his actual birth time anyway. Okay. What I want to point to is um, just a couple of things. I'm not going to uh, interpret or delineate his whole chart, although I would love to do that sometime. That, that would take quite a bit of time. But what I really wanted to show today is, so Prince had a chart that had a lot of uh, emphasis and focus on the right-hand side, as you can see. Um, he's got Mars in Aries in fifth, he's got Lilith in there, got the south node in the sixth, Venus in Taurus in the sixth, we've got Mercury in Gemini in the seventh, uh, Sun in the eighth, Vertex in the eighth, and don't worry about the others for now. That's a lot of, uh, and, and sorry, the Moon down here in fourth as well. The Moon in fourth is an incredibly uh, sensitive, private, in a world and Prince um, was definitely, definitely an incredibly uh, sensitive soul, very deep, very private. And naturally, look, he's got Scorpio, he had Scorpio rising, which adds to the dimension of um, how we saw him in the sense of, you know, he was, he was quite intense, very private, moon in Pisces, very shy. Um, Sun in Gemini, but in the eighth house, and, and Mercury in Gemini in the seventh house. So, Sun in the eighth house um, is a lot of different things, um, but certainly you couldn't get two more different signs Gemini and Scorpio. His Sun in Gemini was just incredible in the sense of you know, his ability to really. Um, connect with the, the feminine and the masculine um, in such a beautiful, natural, stylish, authentic way. You know, he was, you could, some people say that he was almost androgynous, you know, that he, that the feminine and the masculine, just Gemini, you know, <laughs> um, was, was so strong in him. He was able to, uh, those archetypes, uh, the, the Gemini archetype was so strong in him that he was able to resonate and relate both with the masculine and the, family, and the feminine, which you could see very clearly in his wardrobe, for instance. Okay. Anyway, that aside, the, the main thing that I wanted to point to is Pluto on the midheaven, which signifies a lot of different things, but certainly one thing it signifies is um, incredible power struggles. Uh, in his career, okay, uh, in people that he would have had to deal with uh, within his career, which indeed that was the case. If you look back into 
think it was um, early 90s where he began to uh, paint the slave symbol on his cheek and to make a stand and, and make a point of uh, not wanting to be controlled by these record companies who essentially were trying to control him and his music and um, the quality and quantity of his music and so forth. I mean, Prince was an actual genius, <laughs> really. Um, and he just, he, you know, Mars in Aries, he, he, had to, he had to do it his own way, okay? And these people up here from, represented by Pluto, these uh, giant corporations, uh corporate um hierarchy is wanting to control his craft and and he just he just wouldn't have it anymore just it just he couldn't deal with it anymore he couldn't he couldn't um give over his power like that to these people who simply were just money eating demons to put it quite directly um and he's look he's got a lot of planets on the right hand side of the chart which again, you know, based on what I've just described at the first part of this video, that's an indication that Prince himself, you know, he, he felt that a lot of his life was not in his control, which is why he put the word or the symbol slave on his cheek. What does that tell you? When somebody's walking around basically letting the entire world know that they feel like a slave, does that indicate to you that they feel like their life is in their control? Clearly not. <laughs> so there's a, this is a very powerful example to demonstrate the point that I've just tried to demonstrate at the beginning of this video. There are many different facets to this chart. There are many different things we can unpack, but that's the main point that I wanted to bring to uh, your attention today so that you can really um, bring this into your work or into your chart when you're looking at it. The other thing that I wanted to um, point out is, um, just before I do that, I'm just checking to see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Um, no, I think, I think that's it for now, just regarding the, the one main point that I wanted to make um, about his planets on the right hand side of the chart and you know Mars in Aries in the fifth he 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 really needed to be independent and do his own thing which is essentially what he strived for and he was severely punished as a result. Um, there's reasons for that which we will not unpack at this moment uh, emanating from his birth chart. But one last thing that I'll leave you guys with which is um, pretty amazing. I have shown this book before, I think, in a previous video. So if you haven't, sorry, a bit of a, if you haven't uh, seen this or if you haven't heard of it, that's what it's called. And Dane Radio is the author. Dane Radio is, you know, one of the greatest astrologers of our time. Um, this book is basically, uh, it's a symbolic language, pretty much uh, what astrology is anyway. It's a symbolic language, you could say, amongst other things. Um, very simply put, this book depicts the entire zodiac from zero degrees to 360 degrees, so every single degree, because the 12 zodiac signs are made up of 360 degrees divided by 12, uh, which leaves basically one sign equaling 30 degrees. So if you're an Aries and you were born at the beginning of Aries, that would be zero degrees Aries, okay? And Aries would finish at 30 degrees before Taurus begins at zero degrees and so forth. Now, every single degree has a very specific symbolic meaning to it according to this book. And the work of this book was done with uh, Dane Radia, obviously, um, but also uh, a clairvoyant that worked with him and channeled uh, very specific symbols 
and meanings to what every single degree in the entire zodiac represents. This book can be useful um, when you're wanting uh, just a very powerful symbol to midpoint, the degree of the ascendant in your chart, the degree of your sun, the degree of your moon. There's a number of different ways you can utilize this book. Uh, and the way to learn about it is to obviously get a copy of it. So what I want to share with you guys today, and I frankly find this mind blowing. <laughs> Prince's uh, natal moon is at um, one degree and I think it was 59 minutes of Pisces. Okay, so just short of two degrees of Pisces, but it's not quite two degrees, it's just one minute short. When you read this book, by the way, when you look at a symbol, look at a degree, say your sun, for example, was at 25 degrees and 49 minutes of Pisces. Let's just say that was the degree of your sun. You go to this book, you will not look at 25 degrees of Pisces, you will look at 26 degrees of Pisces. That's just how you work with this book. Okay? So, the position, the natal position of Prince's Moon was one something of Pisces. So therefore, what we look at is two degrees of Pisces to get a meaning of what Prince's natal moon symbolizes for his entire life, really. And sometimes you might read a symbol in terms of a degree and it may not make sense. I've, I've found that to have happened on a number of occasions. Fine, it doesn't mean that this doesn't work. It just means that with, with some degrees, it just doesn't seem to fit, you know, with the uh, individual in question. Okay. But on other occasions, it's, it's just phenomenal in terms of what it actually shares. And this just happens to be one of those times. So, Prince's Moon is one something of Pisces, therefore, we go to two degrees of Pisces in this book, which is on page 269. Get this book. What it has, um, I don't know if you can see that, you probably can. It has um, the degree, then it has a keynote, and then it has a, a further paragraph expanding on, on the keynote. Keynote being the, um, the description of what that degree symbolizes. Yes, put it very simply. Okay, with uh, no further ado, here it is. So, the heading for this is a squirrel hiding from hunters. I don't even need to read the rest because if you just listen to that statement, a squirrel hiding from hunters, you need to use your imagination, okay, with, with these um, phrases because clearly, you know, Prince wasn't a squirrel. But it's it's the meaning of what that statement uh, suggests or implies. Now, a squirrel hiding from hunters. Prince was hunted, you know, um, probably for most of his life. And in the end, in my opinion, he was murdered. And there are many people who are of that view as well. And um, I'll just read a little bit further to expand on that uh, heading of what two degrees of Pisces symbolises. So that was Prince's natal moon. The keynote says, the individual's need both to ensure his future substance and to protect himself from aggressive social elements. Um, The individual is never certain of being safe among his fellow men. Once the process of individualization with its negative uh, aspects, competition, social ag aggressiveness and greed forces um, the breakdown of the original tribal state of mankind during the archaic ages. Sorry. 
violence is a possibility never to be dismissed. The need for self-protection and caution is ever-present. I don't think you can get more meaningful and more descriptive than that. That's, that's what Prince's moon, natal moon, uh, describes according to this book. That's pretty phenomenal given the life that he lived, what he went through, how he was hunted, how he uh, basically felt like a slave, you know, all those different facets of his life, which we've only just really touched on um, the tip of the iceberg, as it were. But I just wanted to demonstrate to you how powerful this book can be, how powerful it is to look at the right-hand side of the chart, the left-hand side of the chart. The person has a lot of emphasis on either side. Pay attention. Got a lot to tell you about how their life is operating. Okay, so I think I will leave it there and um, perhaps I'll do a subsequent follow-up video relating to prescribing when a person has many planets, you know, at the bottom of the chart and at the top of the chart. It's pretty self-explanatory if you understand astrology, but there are many viewers on my channel that are at various levels and the reason for that is because I do I have offered some, some basic um, astrology to a degree <laughs> and then I've offered some fairly advanced um, teachings as well. So naturally I'm attracting a number of different people, beginners, more advanced and so forth. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to exclude anybody and I didn't want to limit it to um, beginners or advanced. I want it to be open to anybody who is receptive and open to learning essentially um, because astrology is uh, multi-layered, it's multi-dimensional and the, uh, the sole person uh, who's sharing the information as well uh, brings forth their own their own understanding, intuition and insight as well. So um, it's, it's always beneficial to, you know, to uh, learn from, from different people in life, really, isn't it? But certainly when you're um, learning about astrology, it's always great to look at different types of astrologers because uh, people share things and teach things in very different ways as well. And there's always um, benefit, you know, um, through watching and learning from uh, a variety, I guess you could say. Okay, so, oh, by the way, just before I go, I want to wish you all a very happy solstice. Uh, we're just a couple of days away from the 2018 winter and summer solstice. It's winter here for me. Um, why I got long sleeves on today. It's actually only about 10 degrees outside, but it's been very sunny. Anyway, that aside, um, yeah, happy solstice for all of you and um, the beautiful, beautiful energy, you know, the solstice period. It's, you know, significant of so many things, but certainly significant of a new cycle, new things beginning. Uh, naturally, when there's something new beginning, there are things closing as well. Uh, we have the solar eclipse coming up next month and, you know, we're certainly within range of that energetically at the moment, which is in Cancer, 20 degrees of Cancer opposite Pluto. Um, so don't expect that particular energy to be easy. I expect it to be quite challenging. Um, you know, Cancer is about the, the ego, the inner self, the, uh, the emotional body, uh, emotional security, uh, vulnerability, and, and all those sorts of things. And you know, Pluto opposing it is is going to threaten all of that <laughs> um, because it it's clearly trying to uh, trying to release and transform certain things. So you know, um, don't be surprised if you're feeling this energy quite intensely, uh, particularly if you've got planets at 20 degrees of Cancer or 20 degrees of Capricorn. Um, which I do. I this eclipse actually is right opposite my Mars as well, so certainly brought stuff up for me. The other thing I wanted to mention, just um, which 
uh, is quite interesting is that um, transiting Uranus at the moment is forming um, a square to Mars and a square to Venus. So Venus is in Leo, Mars is in Aquarius. Venus and Leo are opposite each other and they're being squared by Uranus both the T-square. That's only within range um, over the next couple of days, being today's the 19th of June, so it's over the solstice period. And that that T-square is very important, um, and this opposition between Mars and Venus is very important. So I suspect that there'll be um, un unpredictable and uh, disruptive things coming up in relationships for people, but certainly um, ultimately about enabling people to to feel more free in their relationships, I think. Um, it will disturb the status quo because Uranus is uh, not about the status quo. Saturn is about the status quo. So it will, that's why I said it's a disruptive energy. It will shake things up. So don't be surprised if when things get shaken up and locked up in the world of relationships for you. Um, but yeah, look, there's a number of other different factors that will come into that as well. But I just wanted to mention that because I just wrote a little post about it on uh, Facebook today. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Much love and blessings, and see you soon. Namaste. Happy Solstice. Bye.